Michael Metha. With me is Stegis Puncholi, uh, recapping uh, a really frustrating Ravens loss. I'm looking at the win percentage chart right now, and it was Ravens 50% plus all the way up until four minutes to go in the game um, when they when they kind of, when the game slipped away from them, and they just um, you know even when they were up seven late in the game and it felt like it was slipping away, they still uh, you know should have won that game. They had a they had a second and nine. Uh, what a third and 17 or something like that uh, or sorry they had a second and nine that sack from Van Noy to to push the Raiders back and then they gave up the touchdown or they gave up pass interference and then the touchdown um, that that is just not how this team can finish a game um, the entire fourth quarter was, was really off and um, you could argue though that the game was an issue far before then. So, they just I want to I want to start with you, um, like your bird's eye view of of the game, and then getting into some of the specific decisions um, that Harbaugh made, uh, which is really the focus of of this of this podcast, which is just a lot of decisions that Harbaugh has made to start the season. Um, so, what's your bird's eye view of the game? Well, the bird's eye view is, and I think I talked about this last week, is we we hit the checklist perfectly. The the Ravens loss checklist was met with absolute a hundred percent degree of accuracy. Alec texted it to you, I remember, in the middle of the game yesterday. I'm gonna pull it up right now. It was uh special random special teams mishaps, uh poor poor clock management, can't run the ball uh from a neutral game script. The O line looks idiotic at times. Uh, there's random pre-snap penalties, and we're taking the the play clock down to the very last minute. Uh, we're snapping the ball late or, or disorganized at the line because of that. Uh, the defense will have a heroic performance and like do play really really well for three and a half quarters, but over time, bad situational football and them being asked to continuously carry a load will wear them down, and someone will inevitably get loose in the end. And we played all the greatest hits, so. Um, I guess that's kind of the bird's eye view is not necessarily for me of this game. It's really the past. Some people want to say two, I would argue it's more four years of, of this team. Um, and I know that kind of before we talk more on this game, um, and those items in particular that the difference for me between two and four years is that four years ago was 2021 with the great injury crisis in 2020. Lamar went down, the offensive line went down, but the is- these issues were still there. And people kind of chalked that up to injuries and was just like, oh, it'll be fine when the injuries were okay. But these were like structural issues within the team that just simply did not get better, even with the in- injuries come back. It's just better players having the same things happen to them, which yeah. makes it more frustrating, frankly. Yeah, I think um, – and I think the the way that you phrased that, like playing all the greatest tits is like – you know, it's kind of the same thing that happened against the Chiefs. Like, all these things had to happen for the Ravens to lose the game because they, you know, they are a very talented team. They have, you know, they're one of the most talented rosters in the league, I'd argue. And what you're seeing is throwing games away that you should what you should be winning. Because it, it took all of those things for them to lose this game. Um, if, you know, one of those things doesn't happen, if, if, if Tucker manages to make a field goal, and sorry, I have an active puppy on my left. Um, if Tucker manages to make that field goal in the first half. If, you know, the Ravens just have a competent offensive line, um, that game, just fixing one of those things in a single game, the game looks very different. But like you're saying, these are the same issues every game. Uh, I want to start with the the timeout and the challenge usage. Uh, this was an issue against the Chiefs, um, burning timeouts early. And then Harbaugh kind of, he's done this thing in the past, um, where he throws a throws a challenge flag in a situation where you know the other team's rushing the line, trying to get the playoff, and he almost uses it as a pseudo timeout. And he's like, "Okay, well, we have a timeout. I might as well throw the challenge flag. It's like using a timeout, except there's some upside of maybe winning the challenge." And I just think that is trying to cover up an issue that is not able to get it together on defense. And 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 here's the other thing is. The Raiders are rushing the line because they don't know whether it's a catch or not either. Um, but we know with challenges, the way that it's called in the field is typically the way that it stays, unless it's very, very clear. And you know, you're just you're just wasting a timeout at that point. Um, you know, you got to trust your defense to be able to get to the line. I mean, typically when a team does that, they run a pretty basic, you know, pretty basic play just to keep it moving. Um, it's not like they're coming up with some 
big shot downfield as they're rushing to the line of scrimmage. They're rushing just like you are. So I think it's it's two things. One, it's symptomatic of Harbaugh trying to put games away early, um, but you can't really win a game in the fourth quarter like that. Winning that challenge, I really don't think changes the outcome of that game. Uh, I think that you know it may, it maybe it helps on that drive, um, but I'm not even sure if it was a third down. I don't think it was. And so I think that's the other thing. Situationally, you've got to figure out what are you actually gaining by that challenge. And the second thing is, um, it's it's emotional. Um, it, it feels like his challenges are a little bit more emotionally driven than they are driven by, you know, very clear, you know, oh, we think that play was wrong. Um, when you can't get the right call down, he, I think he said it after the game. He said, you know, they're rushing. I can't get the call down from the, vi- you know, whatever video guys he has upstairs. Um so it's all on him. And at that point, I would just say, you know what? Trust your talent. Trust your players. Let them let them play. Let the defense keep working. Um, because at that point, you're reacting to the crowd. You're reacting to your players' frustrations. Uh, I don't remember on the challenges um, specifically if the players uh, signaled to Harbaugh that he should challenge. Um, to, to me, yeah, to me, that's something I was like, I didn't, I didn't think I saw that. And to me, that's something I'm looking for when coaches challenge because the players, the ones right there, um, he was challenging. He challenged a play that was like across the field from him. It was like 40, 50 yards away from him. So, you know, he's just kind of go with his gut. And I don't think that makes sense on a challenge when you know what the rules are. Um, so to it's, me, that's, that's an, to me, that's a, that's an easy fix, but again, that's something that he's actually got to take into account um, and actually change. It's an easy fix if you think it's a problem, but John Harbaugh doesn't think it's a problem. Right, right. Uh, and the challenge is there's, there's a lot that I have thought on the challenges. And so I'm going to go, there's a number of different tangents I'm going to break off of this stuff. I'm going to come back to the challenges each time. Number one, I, you, you, you thought Devontae Adams didn't get two toes down. That's, that's the most, that, you're you you've already lost me here you have already lost me brandon stevens wasn't exactly like waving his arms like Devontae was out of bounds or like going to the rep or looking at the rep brandon stevens was getting ready to go back to the puddle nobody in that entire stadium thought that Devonte adams didn't get two toes down certainly enough to certainly not enough to overturn the call if that call was called incomplete they in the raiders challenge it would have been changed to complete that's how definitive it was it is Devonte adams you like i and this is where you and i have spoken about this before and certainly not recording this because it's the second time we've done this um but about the need for accountability um in a post-game press conference and how you t- have taken the approach of um that it's not necessarily as important as the on-field product and i've always said that like no i want to see my especially if you're going to position yourself as the ceo head coach the manager head coach i think that there needs to be a degree of accountability in the post game presser and the more i've thought about it it's because i need you you need to show your work here after a little bit you need to tell me what like like I can sit here and speculate all damn day about what you thought was going in your head when you didn't think Devonte Adams didn't get two toes down. But if you're able, like, there's not much that you can tell me that's gonna be that's gonna have me think like, oh, like that was a bad decision. But I need to know at least, like, you telling me why you did what you did is better than me assuming the worst, and better than the team assuming the worst, better than your players assuming the worst than you. Um, and so that's where I think it's like especially needed for the accountability, just so we can understand what the idea was. Even if it's a bad idea, just let us know what the idea was. Um, and when it comes to the Zay Flowers one, again, no one in the, the crowd is the crowd. Like 70,000 people could be murmuring because they put the free McNuggets thing on the board. That is not how you decide to make a challenge. Zay Flowers did was not exactly. I think Zay Flowers signaled he had a catch once or twice, and but that he's a wide receiver. They all they all have no wide receivers ever not thought they got two toes down ever. Um, but he went back to the huddle. They were getting organized, and it was like a long duration between the the catch, the call, and then the challenge. It was like probably thirty seconds, and I know because the play clock naturally was ticking down. 
And it was like at the close to the end of the play clock, and they were about to snap the ball, and then they and then John Harbaugh drops the flag, and Lamar Jackson is jumping up and down because he wanted to snap the ball because no player on the offense wanted to actually challenge the ball. They wanted to run the offense, and so at that point, I'm just like, you're getting in your own players' way right now. You are getting in your own players' way for the sake of what well, 15 yards, maybe. 15 yards and you get the right to a third challenge, whoop de do. Um and I just got back there because I'm like, this seems there's a disconnect then between what the players wanted to do and what the coach wanted to do. Whoever's right, whoever's wrong, it doesn't really matter to me. The fact that you're not aligned just as a whole unit says enough for me. If you're gonna be the players coach, if you're gonna be the one to empower Lamar Jackson, do this, that, and the other, then at some point you have to look up at the field and be like, oh, okay, he just wants to go. Let's go. Um, and then we get to what, going back to what we said before about showing your work, letting us know what the thought process behind this is. Knowing John Harbaugh, watching him for the better part of 15 years now, like we, the best way that we can describe it is what you said. It's the two for one. It's the classic John Harbaugh two for one. We can sneak this in there where we get a free timeout for this play that's a high leverage situation and we also maybe there's like a 10 15 percent chance that like we do get the um that we do get the channel call overturned and maybe there's some camera angle or whatever and i'm sure like over the course of like the long run if you're gonna statistically extrapolate this like and remove any context of a call from it like sure you might win one in 10 of these, and because you won one in 10, but you got the timeout all 10 times, it's worth it. But here's the thing. There's never a bad time in football to take a timeout. There's just better times to take a timeout. So John Harbaugh in his head is like, it's second and second and eight. Who cares who has the ball in the third quarter with seven minutes left? Oh, this could be a really big down here because if they convert to second and eight, they're going to be in like close to the red zone or they're going to be close to field goal range or we won't have them pinned back. There's never a bad time to call a timeout. And because of that, it feels, again, I don't know what's going on in his head, so we can only assume, but it feels like it's just a matter of, oh, this seems like a lucky opportunity for us to take a timeout. We surely will just put them away and then we won't need these later on. Meanwhile, you have Antonio Pierce on the other sideline, not using a timeout, and in fact, saving a timeout just to ice Justin Tucker for the hell of it sometimes. Like, that, like, that is just this, and Antonio Pierce, who had, by the way, I think it was the, I think the Cowardly Index had it as the worst, what was it, he, like, kicked a field, he punted from his, uh, the opponent 40, yeah. down seven or whatever. It was, like, the most egregious call that was universally criticized by everyone made John Harbaugh, uh, and John Harbaugh, by comparison, made him look like prime Bill Belichick with uh, his management there. Um, and it just, like, it's not that it's happened once or twice in a game or anything like that. It's, again, it's been a thing for years, which is why I know, or I don't think necessarily, this one game will be, uh, this is not, this game, like, where this loss stinks is it's not going to be a tipping point. Because if it, there was going to be a tipping point, it feels like there would have been a tipping point, at least on this issue with the challenges. Yeah, in past seasons, it's felt like there's, you know, a tipping point in the positive direction where they finally get it all together and go. It it does not feel like, um, and you talked about this, when they face adversity, um, they aren't able to, aren't able to overcome it. And that, to me, this, to me, this goes in, in two directions. Uh, the first is uh, the, the idea that Harbaugh is a player's coach. And this is something you were talking about before we started the podcast. Uh, he had this, tw- the 2020, 2021, 2022 seasons, um, all the injuries, Lamar being out. He got a lot of props for his ability to take a pretty shorthanded roster deeper than people expected and, and arguably deeper than they should have been. And that's all, that's all well and good. Uh, and I think that's why people look at it as the last two years, as opposed to the last four, uh, because, those issues were present, but they were overshadowed by the bigger injury issues. And the Ravens pulled out some games that they had no business winning. And so that, that is all true of Harbaugh. And he, you know, gets, I think plenty of credit for that, but now this team has all their talent and they're healthy uh, for the vast majority of the team. They're, they're very they're healthier than they've been in, in a few seasons. And now is when you have to play up to your talent, not, you know, you don't, 
playing above it, playing above it before was great. Now you just need to play up to your talent to win games, and they're not. Uh, and I think there's there's the, the, the adversity thing is another thing, which is you don't you don't see them change. Um, and and changing within a game is kind of a myth. Like the halftime adjustment is kind of a kind of a myth. Um, it's really more throwing out what doesn't work and um, that's kind of hard to do when you put yourself in a drop back only situation in the fourth quarter every time. So to me, it's more about week to week changes and, and you just don't see week to week changes being made. And, and here's the other week to week change that um, I, I want to get to is the offensive line. And I think this is another example of kind of the, the stubbornness of Harbaugh. And like, you know, you said earlier, like, Oh, Harbaugh doesn't think challenges and timeouts are a problem. He says he talked about it the same way with his offensive line. Um, you know, I think it was clear that they were they had issues against the Chiefs, and he only seemed encouraged coming out of that. Um, they did not look good at all. I mean, this, the Daniel Falele at guard. I mean, I Falele seems like a nice guy. He is not a guard. Um, he is he's been a fine swing tackle since he's been drafted. Actually, he's been actually pretty competent when he's had to come in the game at left and right tackle. But then moving him into guard um, to me is, you know, you're 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 just trying to do something a player can't do and you're not putting him in a position to succeed. I think it's partially on the front office for how, how they approach the O-line in the offseason. Um, but to me, that's something that is they have to fix going into next season. The front office has to do there's, you know, either offensive line trades don't really happen mid season, the NFL, it's just not really a thing um, to me, the very easy fix. And this is where I think, you know, they have a chance for some accountability is if Ben Cleveland gets, you know, the right guard spot, because they talk about putting in their best five, one of their best five in the game. Falele is not one of those best five, not when he's playing guard. Um, there are there are situations where you can put a guy out of position and, and you're going to get um, enough out, out of him to still do well. Falele is not one of those guys. He's not built to be a he's not built to be a guard. Uh, and in terms of accountability and you know fighting adversity, this is a point where it says, okay, we've tried it for two games. Um, I think in, in training camp in the preseason, we were like, oh, wow, like they're really serious about this. Uh, there, were, there were reasons for that. They, they wanted Falele's pass protection. Um, and that's great when it's just a straight rusher at him. But in the end of the game, when he faced a stunt, he couldn't move to get to Max Crosby. Uh, he couldn't pick up the stunt. And it's not just a physical thing. It's a mental one, too. It's just he is not accustomed to playing guard. It's not a fit for his skill set. And... Uh, again, this is nothing against Philly personally. I think as a fourth round draft pick, being a swing tackle is a fine place to end up with, you know, I think if the Ravens tried to actually develop him as a tackle, he could get somewhere, but they haven't done that this year. Instead, they've went with him over a guy who has a lot of stars, a lot of snaps and um, has performed well. I think one of the things I was saying all preseason was your offensive line is only as good as your weakest link. And if Ben Cleveland is your weakest link, there are really worse places to be if you're the Ravens, especially looking at what else you had on the roster and the decisions you made this off season. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you have any other takes on the offensive line. To me, it's just another example of, you know, kind of the, the stubbornness. And for once it's the coaching staff compounding a mistake by the front office. Usually this front office has been quite good. This is a big miss by the front office. Uh, if it's, you know, I, it's, it's incongruent with kind of their strategy because you could argue they're saying, okay, well, we, your offensive line is going to take a step back this year in the name of long-term development, but that's not what this team's professed strategy is ever. And nor does that make sense when you have Lamar Jackson, you have the rest of the talent on this team. So to me, there's really no explanation for it. And there's really no reason that Daniel Flaley plays another, starts another game at guard, unless there's a bevy of injuries. When has any team gotten better by sacrificing up the offense line? Never. Exactly. No, no football team in history. Like you and I disagree on how easy it is to be like, a, an NFL coach or an executive. My point is simply that I think it's much easier to not be bad than people think in the NFL. And I like I do recognize that it's very, very hard to be good. Very, very, very hard to be good. But it's very easy, I think, or simple, let me say, not easy, but simple to not be bad philosophically, and it's called build an offensive line. And if you want proof in the pudding, the Cleveland Browns and Detroit Lions built an offensive line. And became playoff teams. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and, and, and again, you were saying earlier how this hasn't been an issue, you know, just once. And, you know, and they did it when they did it before. This yeah, is where I get this, is, this, this is this has been an issue with Villanueva in the past. I will I will defend Eric DaCosta till I die. That is my my GM Eric DaCosta. It still is my GM Eric DaCosta for the record. No one's coming at if you call for Eric DaCosta job, I'll tell you right now that you're an idiot. Um if you even think about it, I'll tell you you're an idiot. But this is a miss. This is like probably his first forget the wide receiver crisis of the early 2020s. Like I'm not even gonna address that because Part of that probably was also reflective of the team's philosophy at times, set by the head coach. But this one, I, I just don't, I just don't understand why all of these transitions had to happen at the same time. I do not understand why anyone thought that a seventh round. He is a seventh rounder. I understand the pedigree that Andrew Voorhees has. He is a seventh round, second year player, basically playing his rookie season. So he's either a seventh, a second year seventh rounder or a rookie third rounder, say. Regardless, on your left guard, you have Ronnie Stanley, who is a wonderful human being, but was flawed last year, playing really well this year, I will mm-hmm. say, uh, at left tackle. But again, that was an unknown quantity heading into the season. You have Tyler Linderbaum, who is the probably the most stable, trustworthy member of that line. Mm-hmm. And then you jettison Kevin Zeitler because, oh, we don't like he's older. He got banged up last year at the end. Like, who knows? For Daniel Falele, who is bad, like, the un- like, we were like, it's the idea of being comfortable with. We are not comfortable with the uncertainty that uh, Kevin Zeitler's age and health may, may have on this team. We are comfortable, though, with Daniel Falele transitioning to guard when he was never a guard to begin with. He doesn't have the body type for a guard, especially in a Todd Monk and offense. But we're comfortable with that one because we're just going to figure it out. Uh, we're not comfortable with Morgan Moses, but at least you drafted a second-round rookie who has looked promising at times, but also we're going to platoon him with the swing man next to said man, Daniel Falele, who's learning a new position. So we're not going to even try to build any consistent chemistry between the right guard and right tackle. It just, I don't, I just don't, I just don't know why it all had to happen at once. I yeah, thought. and and you know you mentioned you mentioned Zeitler. It's also Morgan Moses, uh, right? Mo- jettisoning Mor- Moses on an affordable contract. You know, you could argue money was the reason that they moved on from Zeitler and Mo- Moses as well. They played in those decisions, but again, doing both is just such a mistake. And that's you know, we can really we can relitigate that all we want. Um, now it's up to the coaching staff and and to 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 make to make the necessary changes. I think you know Voorhees. Stanley, like you said, has been very good. Linderbaum has been good. Voorhees has been fine. I haven't seen anything like glaring with him when I'm like, get this guy out of there. Um, but like you're saying, it's not a strength. And then you have you, see, you have a you have a potential weak spot there, at least not a strength there. And then the right side just gets caved in all the time because you know, like you said, you, there, there's no chemistry. Falele is not built to be a guard. Um, I think McCarry has done McCarry's done fine. Rosengarten has done fine, but you're rotating those guys in and out, and they're not getting comfortable in a game. They're not getting set next to, you know, Falele at right guard, who played the whole game, which doesn't make any sense to me why you wouldn't at least think about rotating Cleveland in. So, again, we t- the challenges, the o- O-line, those to me are, like, slightly easier fixes. Um, the answers are a little bit clearer, um, but will they execute them is the bigger question. And this, to me, goes into the bigger picture of um, – kind of the long term and where, where does this all go on the offensive side of the ball? We could talk about the defense a little bit um, after this, but I, I want to focus still on the offense here because as much as I like Todd Munkin, as much as I like what he brings to the offense, that's still a hard ball higher and you're still having the same issues um, that you're having before. You're still having really, really shoddy play call on high leverage downs and, um, I think that they were miserable on third. And I saw like three for eight, three for 18 or something like that. They were absolutely horrific on third down. And so you have really bad play call on third down and you're just not putting yourself in a position to succeed. Um, I don't think any particular offensive player had a bad game um, outside of the offensive line. Right. I felt like, you know, Jackson was pretty good. He missed a couple throws downfield. That's going to happen. Receivers were getting open. Like, I, I thought the offense functioned 
quite well for a majority of the game and then they get into third down and they just can't they just can't get it together. They're not ready for the blitzes. They're not ready for the prep, the stunts, the pressure packages. Um, and that tends to implode their third downs more than, more than anything else. So I, I also think you don't see them in as many third and shorts. Um, you don't see them in as many adv- advantageous downs. Um, I, I don't know what the, the, the script is, the early down play calling plan is. Um, but to me, it just seems like it's all the same issues from a new coordinator that, you know, a lot of people are excited about, and I, I like Munkin too. I think he's, you know, a great offensive mind, but it goes back to, it's all the same issues that we've had before. Um, and who the, who, who the constant is, who's the consistent factor, who's the same guy there. It's horrible. And so the, these are the bigger fixes. These are, you know, where does this all go? The Ravens always say, you know, you want to get, you move on from a player a year too early rather than a year too late. That might have been the thinking with Moses and Zeitler, um, but they don't do that when it comes to coaches. Um, they, they they really haven't done that when they when it comes to coaches historically. Coordinators they've kept on for too long, um, and you know, I don't think anyone's looking for a midseason change when it comes to Harbaugh. Um, but I think his job has just felt so safe for so long that the the issues of accountability don't. You know, start to be an issue because <clears throat> you just have the same guy in there and you're not changing. Um, so the, the Ravens need to critically evaluate Harbaugh this season. I think it's, you know, I, I, as much as I like the guy and, and, you know, not, not that I want to get, not that I give him a pass for all the injuries and stuff they dealt with. Cause again, I think that, you know, helped his, reputation that he did a good job coaching those seasons it's hard to argue that but that was then and this is now and he can't rest on the laurels of oh well i brought an injured team to the playoffs tw- two years in a row or he didn't even bring him to the playoffs that first year but um i you know i can bring injured teams to the playoffs and i can withstand all this and like that's great but when it's good can you make it great so when it's bad you can make it okay you can make it good and that's that 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 has value like that is something that is good about john harbaugh but when the team is good, he can't make them great. Um, or if the anything, when John, the team yeah. is great, he keeps them from being great. That's the difference between John and Jim right now. Great. Yeah. We're going to find out with Jim. Jim's more of an unknown quantity. Jim is not proven with good degree, but we have seen Jim do this more than we have seen John. Whether yeah. he can do it in the NFL again, we do not know. And look, when Mike he, Mack barely snuck past the Patriots. I'm not saying that Mike Mack is something you want to run the I NFL. The Patriots are a better team than people think. Them. Yeah, so. um, but I, and I'm not saying that Mike Max is going to go run the NFL for the next five years with the Seahawks or anything like that. Um, I I just think that you know you were probably more vocal than I was about it um, when it comes to replacing Harbaugh with McDonald in the off season. I was like, m- my approach to it was like, I would love that. I don't think that they're. I just don't see the Ravens doing that. Um, now is the time where you have to start. I think inside the building, you really have to start thinking about it. I don't even think it was a thought inside the building um, this off season was, and, and for, for better and for worse, the Ravens way and, you know, all that stuff and the relationships and the building and the way they like to run their franchise and that, that stuff has its upsides, but we're looking at the downsides now. And, and we're looking at a head coach who, you know, you could argue has just grown maybe too comfortable. That's why the accountability thing is an issue. Uh, or, you know, at a certain point, you just, you just need to make a change. Um, there are plenty of teams who have gone from good head coaching situations, decent head coaching situations, um, and gotten better just because they've made a change that better fits who, who they want to be as a team. I'm laughing right now, not because I think you're wrong, because quite the opposite, because I remember when we had this conversation, I don't know if it was the last year or two years ago, it would have been two years ago because I was actually quite happy with this last year. Um, and I, t- and I think I told you it was something that I think you've come around on, and, but you got very angry at me at the time for saying it. It's, I do believe that being unlucky is grounds to get fired. If you're unlucky enough times, I think it's grounds to get fired in the NFL. Because I think it's – and not. I don't, think it's, even, I don't think it's unlucky, though. Like, they're, they're not, not being unlucky. Like, it's the whole luck. injury thing, like, that's unlucky. But, you're like, you look at what Harbaugh did at that, and you're not going to fire him after no, what he I, did and I, that. I, I'm not. And I'm not saying that it's actually luck, but what I'm trying to explain to you now is what you just said is what I meant in that moment of sometimes you just got to switch it up. You just got to switch it up sometimes. Like just, so so just that I get. That I get. Putting it on like, oh, well, he has bad luck 
is like, like to me, that's like firing Brandon Staley after that first Chargers season when he went for it on fourth down a bunch of times, when he should have gone for it on fourth down a bunch of times. And like, no, that was what, bad I mean, luck. what I mean by that is, I mean, in terms of like Marvin Lewis, and more, it felt like there was a black cat running around the Bengals with Marvin Lewis in the playoff wins. And then they just could not, no matter what happened. And so that's what I meant when I said that. But I think now we've, we've understood it. Uh, he's a little bit better there, which is why I was laughing. Yeah, I mean, but, you know how frustrating I get sometimes with like narratives and intangibles, and luck feels like that to me. But that word that I would use that I think applies better, that is still like one of those intangibles, but I think fits better, is like just the energy. Um, you know, his his vibe. frustration on the sidelines, right? You see Harbaugh getting frustrated on the sidelines, and some people are like, oh, like he's he's passionate, he's fighting for his players. To me now, I've turned to see that more as um, like him just getting caught up in the moment of, you know, oh, I'm so frustrated by this thing. And I, I got, you got to move on to the next play. You got to move on to the next drive, the next quarter, everything, um, because calls aren't going to go your way. We saw a bunch of calls around the NFL today that were pretty bad. There were some in the Ravens game. That happens. Ravens fans say it happens to them more often. Maybe that's true if you actually – but if I think if you extrapolate it out over the course of like a longer period of time, the, the, it's not that stark. Um, I, I don't think it's that I don't I don't think it's that big a deal. And, and when you talk about the refs, you look at the game against the Chiefs and you look at this game and you say the refs shouldn't have had a role in determining e either of those games. The Ravens, you know, if you want to argue the the refs helped the Raiders win that game, it was only because the Ra Ravens let the game get to that point. Um, and again, that's. That that's an area where the talent of this team should have should have been able to win a game regardless of a couple bad calls. There are three types of football games. Actually, no, I'm not going to get into that real quick. I'm going to address what you said about stubbornness before because there's something I wanted to bring up that I wanted to say, and it's about the stubbornness of the or of the organization with their coaches and everything like that. And it's because John Harbaugh became management. I'm not saying this is a bad thing because John Harbaugh is a very good football mind and a very good for the most part football overseer. My opinion on John Harbaugh on what he does on a football field on Sundays is not indicative of what I think of him as a football operationalist executive type role. I, cause I think that is now folded into his job and I think he is decent and average at one. And I think he's shambolic at another. So I want to say that part of John being management now for lack of a better term is John also kind of removed his own accountability there, I feel. It feels like, again, we do not know because we do not, we are not allowed to know because tight-lipped, no transparency, which I do understand for this specific context as well. But, again, it feels like with coordinators, they we stuck with coordinators because they were John's guys. John wasn't going to get rid of his guys because John believes in his guys and this is John's team and those are John's guys. Which kind of just then reflected itself back on the John. John, for lack of a better term, is kind of his own boss right now. He answers to Steve Bishotti, obviously, but um, in terms of the evaluation of it, to cost and Harbaugh more like partners rather than one overseeing the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think right now that makes critical evaluation much more difficult. Um, but going to what I was saying now and kind of bringing it back to the game itself, I like sort of thinking about it in terms of the offensive line, especially with Derrick Henry, which I know you wanted to touch on as well with Derrick Henry and his usage and kind of how it feels. And there's three types of football games for this team. There's the games they win, which are, uh, positive game scripts, got out to a fast start, probably throwing the ball. Um, defense gets an early turnover, you're up two scores, and you just steamroll them into the ground, which was essentially the entirety of the 2023 season, which is why the 2023 season was so much fun, because they were so supremely talented on both sides of the ball to just jump out and then um, kind of just save off anyone else just by virtue of being more talented than the other, and by being smarter than them at times. I will give them credit for being smarter than other teams at times. Then there's the other two. There's the games where it's kind of going so-and-so. It's going to be decided in the fourth quarter. It's back and forth. It's not necessarily a bad game yet, um, but it's nervy, penalty, frustrating. Penalties go both both ways. 
folks are tired. It's a war of attrition, a, a middle ground game is what I call it. Um, and, you know, you'd like to think they've split those evenly. I think as fans, we tend to remember the bad ones a little bit more, but I'm going to be nice and say that um, they, they've split those evenly. Because also that 2021 season, like you said, had a lot of um, nonsensical wins to offset the nonsensical losses. And then we have uh, the games where they're losing, where they face adversity, where they're down early. Um, Chiefs game last year, uh, Titans game, where the other team kind of flips on their head. They're down early. They've got to rally and come back. It's time for the defense to come up with a clutch sack fumble or a clutch pick and time for the offense to really to run some two-minute mix and tempo and switch things up. Um, and so kind of relating this back to – what I was saying before with Derek Henry and the offensive line, they obviously can win the first game every single time, you feel like. They struggle now with the second game, and that's where it feels like they brought Derrick Henry in for. They brought Derrick Henry not to win the third game, which may be malpractice in and of itself. I'm not going to do running backs matter versus they don't because I don't think it's a useful conversation, and frankly, it doesn't matter for this game anyway. Um, but they brought Derrick Henry in for those nervy games for those frustrating games where you've had penalties both ways, for when it's been a physical war of attrition, for those games where things may not be clicking perfectly on either side. Maybe you've had an injury or two thrown in there, but at the end of the day, you got to win the damn game. Go put the ball in that dude's hands. He is a born closer. Born closer. He's closed this team out twice. Very mm -hmm. famously, might I add, closed this team out twice. Um, against And they were a better team. For the, and he closed better teams out single-handedly. And that's what they brought him to do, to be a closer for those middle games where you just, eh, going back and forth, but you got to win it. You need to lean on your talent, and that's what he is. And then with three minutes left after a war of attrition, with three minutes and 46 seconds left, it's a tie game. You have the ball on your own, 25, 30, whatever. They do a straight drop back, a five-man protection straight drop back. And... Ask to get sacked in the face by Max Crosby, get sacked in the face by Max Crosby, and then get up and proceed to have the most two most cowardly play calls I've ever seen in my entire life. Which was like I, I don't I don't I don't know why anyone thought that was a good idea. It, yes. In terms of that that Justice Hill draw sent me to the moon. Yeah, so the draw the draw was really bad. Uh I, I think the but that, that was consistent of their their high leverage play call all game. It was, you know, not not getting guys beyond the sticks, something we've seen something that frustrated me to no end with Roman, another consistent there. Uh what, the thing I see with Henry, I was I was more encouraged by his use in this in, in this game. We started to see what he can do. Um, but exactly what I wrote in Battle Plans was about him closing out this game, him helping the Ravens close out this game. And they just went away from it. And it was something that was working and i think with henry is one of the guys where he wears down a defense you started to see it in the second half where the raiders defense was starting to get a little bit overwhelmed by him rushing at them and it's just another one of those situations where you and this is this to me was the cardinal sin of the chiefs game um and it to me it raises a bigger question now i'll get in a second but you profess this identity this organizational culture this identity the coaching staff the players what you you know harbaugh harbaugh on down professes this identity of smash mouth and bringing the games to the opponent and stuff like that. And then they do this in the fourth quarter. They, they go away from Henry. They go away from their identity. And to me, that raises two questions. One, I, I, what, what is their identity now? What is their identity on offense now? I know they've been trying to move, you know, to more dropbacks from Lamar to a, a more efficient passing game. I get that. But you still have Lamar and Derrick Henry in the backfield. That is still going to be your identity on offense. and. Two, if that's not your identity, then what is it and what's what's the plan? Um, so it's either you're going away from your, your identity or the identity you claim to have, you don't, and you just don't have one in general. Either way, it's not a good thing. I think it's more the former than it is the latter. Um, but to me, it also goes over to Todd Munkin and, and, and goes over those play calls on third down. W what is the strategy there? Because there's, oh, I like this play. I want to call this play. 
Um, but there's got to be a coherent strategy across third downs where it's like, okay, this is what we try and do on third down. We try and work open space on a third and four. We're going to try and get three and go for it on fourth down that, you know, have some consistent strategy there. And it just does not feel like that play call competency was there from Munkin either. They don't have an identity because I don't think they've ever had one because or they're not honest about it they can say all they want and i remember i don't know what the clip was i think it was after um the chiefs win at home uh when john harwell was giving his rah-rah speech and said you know why we won that game because we ran it with power we ran power at the end my favorite play my dad's favorite play we ran power 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 um that's the identity right big offensive lineman greg roman dialing up pullers left and right to just blow a, a you know what's face off um power 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 uh offset lines power 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 uh afc championship game time what do we do the opposite because yeah. we're going to be smart we're going to be tricky we're going to be they won't see this coming they want us they don't want us to run the ball so they think we're going to run the ball so let's instead pass the ball because that makes sense because if we should do what they want us to do what they prefer us to do because if we, they think we're going to do what we don't, it just right. They're not playing it, their game. No, and, and they in, never in play any their sport. Game. In any sport that you're playing against someone else, um, I was watching the UFC fights on on Saturday. I don't know if you you watched those at all, but every single fight was decided by who was setting the terms of the fight, who was dictating how we're going to do this fight, and if they prevented the other the other uh, fighter from getting into their game, into their fighting style, they won very early. And they, they took they took them out completely. And the Ravens just don't do that. They don't dictate their style and opponents. They don't come out and say, this is the kind of game we're going to play. Um, because like we're both saying, they have this identity they profess, and then they don't go out and execute their it. Their style is front running. That's the style. The style is front running. Yeah, and that's not going to work because it's not going to work every week. It's any given Sunday. There are going to be games like this where you get down. Again, I did not feel like the offense played that poorly in the first half. That you know, I but think. But then execute in the red zone, which is fine, right? You have bad but weeks. You have bad weeks, but you can't compound them by you know coaching issues and then just falling apart in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, I think it's worth mentioning that Justin Tucker missed another lengthy field goal. Um, I don't think this is like you know the death knell for Justin Tucker and also anything crazy like that. I do think it means that John Harbaugh needs to think more about when he's sending him out to kick a field goal and what situations he's sending him out to kick a field goal. Because when you miss a 50-yard field goal, the other team gets the ball, the spot the ball was placed out. That is a big swing to give them good field position. Um, and you know I'm not saying fourth and seven you need to go for it. Uh, you know on on their 40 or on you know on their 50 or whatever, but um, whether it's kicking a field goal or punting, you got to really critically think about that decision, and um, especially with Tucker moving <clears throat> forward. These are all ways that we can see improvements in this coaching philosophy over the next couple of weeks. Um, it's just a question of if we'll see it. I know you don't think we will. I am less. I am also not confident that we think that that we'll see changes like this. But at least, I mean, I like being able to identify what they are. I think there were some times in the past where you know what you were saying about luck um, and the energy and the vibes, it was hard to pinpoint, okay, but what do you actually change? What do you actually do to win that game? I think this game is a very clear example of here are five things that you did that you need to fix and that you should be able to fix your timeout challenge uses, the offensive line, your use of Derrick Henry situationally throughout the game, your play call on high leverage downs. Um, and that last bit of just the vibes with your players and like like you were saying when, when the ravens want to run the next play after that zane completion the only reason you throw that challenge flag is if you are a thousand percent certain and he was not and he admitted it in his post-game press conference so to me i think it's it's nice to have at least identified those things that that they can that they can fix um so that i know what i'm looking for in future games and i know what i'm going to evaluate harbaugh on in future games on a on a more strict basis than just saying win loss or you know they you know they had bad luck i think it's very clear where you know where the losses are coming from uh i want to move on to unless you have any last points on on monk and harbaugh the offense i want to talk a little bit on the defense before moving to a couple positives from sunday's game and then talking about the cowboys next week 
No. All right. So let's move on to the defense here. Um, they gave up 26 points to a, a Raiders team that they were far more talented than. Um, the, the defense did their job. Um, they've given up a lot of passing yards because they've been put in a lot of situations where the opponents are just going to, you know, straight dropbacks. Um, Minshew had minus, you know, one point, uh, a one point, or sorry, minus 0.14 EPA per dropback. Not a great game for him. They did a really good job forcing him to hold on to the ball. Um, but you give Devontae Adams enough chances downfield, he is going to beat Brandon Stevens. That was the matchup I highlighted in battle plans as well. Uh, Stevens did a good job early in the game getting his head around and, and did a good job against Adams. But this is exactly what I wrote. Adams is the kind of receiver who is studying you as you play. He is studying what Stevens does. He's finding ways to take advantage of, oh, he beat me this way, so he's going to try and beat me this way again, so here's how I beat him on the next rep. And we saw that happen late in the game. We saw that happen with Adams on multiple occasions. The flag was a terrible flag, but Devontae Adams gets that call. I, like, okay. Um, I, I'm not that concerned about the defense um, overall. Or is having some of the same growing pains that McDonald had. Um, but we talked about last week, some of the same growing pains, um, getting more used to just straight drop back passing situations and, and, and just getting more used to your play call and mixing up your coverages. Um, I'm not sure how much there is to say about the defense outside of that, because you covered early on the, the situations that the offense was putting them in with, um, with, with the field position and the decisions that Harbaugh was making. It's it's a it's a heroic effort every time. It's a heroic, valiant, futile in the end effort. Um, I think I told you before. I think it was three drives where the Raiders started at their own forty yard line or better. Um, frankly, I don't. I want to say they gave up maybe like thirteen points off the top of my head for those three drives, which is kind of remarkable when you think about it. Um. I actually like what I've seen a lot from Zach Orr. I think that they've not had nearly the drop off I thought they would. And again, it's, this is a lot of this is also seeing what they looked like last week and between last week and this week. I actually like Zach Orr is like the least of my concerns, even on the defense. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, I, I think, think Zach Orr has settled in very, very well. The issues with the defense have been they put in bad situations and then just random individual errors or bust but that's early in the season that can get that can be fixed and i didn't feel uh, like that was an issue this game i felt like the issue this game was um one brock bowers is that guy uh brock bowers is, is a very very good tight end the raiders did a good job getting him into some favorable matchups and um there, there were a number of situations where great offense beat great defense yes that and, and the, that's gonna happen um that's okay well i think or understands that the players understand that I'm not not worried about the defense. Um, in fact, I think and we can move to the positive. That was, you know, some of the defensive performances were the few positives from this game. Um, OA and Travis Jones were just wrecking up front. They had fantastic. I felt like the whole defensive line, really Kyle Van Noy playing with a fractured orbital had a great game. So the defensive front um, looks honestly maybe just as good as it did last year, even after losing Clowney. Um, they, they, they consistently were getting pressure on Minshew up the middle from the edges um the run game i felt like was pretty solid throughout i don't know what the stats look like on that now i'm curious um yeah i mean um, zamir Wright had 24 yards on nine carries um they obviously the raiders were in a lot of passing situations they ended up being in a lot of passing situations so they didn't run the ball too much um uh, but when they did they got nothing they they did not do good on the ground i think every single one of their ball carriers had a negative epa um negative rush yards over um, ex, um over expected just an overall really really solid game from the defense and the defensive front in general the secondary i felt like played better than they did against the chiefs they didn't have any big collapses on the backside. you had adams beating stevens uh, a couple times i felt like otherwise marlon had a pretty solid game nice interception um i also thought one positive from this game on the offensive line was that roger rosengarten actually looked pretty dang good i thought he had a pretty solid game um, I, you know, when he was in the game, going back to McCarry, I don't know. I honestly don't know if I would have gone back to McCarry at the end of that game. The, it clearly seems to be the strategy <clears throat> to have McCarry start the game, work in Roger, and then go back to McCarry at the end of the game. But to me, this is another example of 
got to read what's going on. Got to You got to be able to see what everyone else in the stadium and everyone watching on TV can see, which is Roger Rosengarten is holding up against Max Crosby. And yep. that is a big deal in this game. It ended up being a huge factor. Um, so that is kind of a, again, another thing going back to the offensive line that they need to see and fix, but at the same time, a positive for Rosengarten in and of himself. Uh, did you have any other big positive takeaways from this game? I know this wasn't a super uh, let's go Ravens game. Defensive line, um, Zay Flowers played well in the first half, caught everything thrown his way. Angry on Twitter now, so we really are reliving 2021 um, with the greatest hits there. But um, Paul Lamar Jackson played relatively well. Yeah, like I said early on, he missed he missed one or two throws downfield. This to be expected. Um, again, he is running around behind a shoddy offensive line. Like that is the biggest, the hardest part to evaluate his performance. And I think the reason I'd overall give him a solid B plus, if not a minus over these first two games is just because he is doing a lot when he is under pressure very quickly. Um, I think it's also on Munkin to work more kind of rhythm and flow into the offense instead of these longer developing routes and plays. Um, but I think Lamar is doing great with, with what he has. Um, I would maybe we've talked about this last week. I'd love to see him either not override Munkin, but either fully take the reins um, on offense when he sees something. I, I think that's just still something I'd love to see a little bit more of is when he is, is let him kind of really run the offense when he sees something at the line of scrimmage instead of just going into kind of these preset audibles, these preset checks. That may be one change I would make because I felt like they didn't do a great job of adjusting to the Raiders at the line of scrimmage, just know what the Raiders were doing. Um, but I still think that is kind of built into the limitations of this offense and the offensive line as it is, and is a little bit less about Lamar um, because there's only so much Lamar can do to overcome. So, yeah, I mean, again, this team has a chance with Lamar in this defense in every game. It's just that they shouldn't just have a chance. They should be winning, especially against the Raiders. Mm-hmm. Um, moving forward against the Cowboys, Mike Parsons and Mike Zimmer are going to wreck the right side of this offensive line. Uh, they are, they're going they're you know, Crosby and Wilkins, Crosby was incredible. Crosby was great. He was as good as everyone expected him to be against the right side of the offensive line. The Cowboys saw that. They got a beating at the hands of the Saints, and they're going to be looking to take it out um, on the Ravens' offense. And Parsons, in particular, seemed really frustrated in that Saints game. So I think, you know, to me, that is the biggest thing to watch. Do they make any changes in the offensive line? We'll see. Um, I don't think so. And I think that that is just setting them up for failure in this next game against the Cowboys. Again, I think they can handle the Cowboys offense just fine. Um, they can figure out how to defend CD lamb. Um, their running game is not what it used to be, um, but it's a, it's a good secondary and it's a good front. And I just think that spells disaster for, for this Ravens team that really just has not gotten settled along their offensive line to start the season. It's just going to be, which of course means that they're going to come in and just rock the Cowboys right now that we're it's saying this be, and, and, and everyone's going to be like, Oh, it's okay. And they can do it. And it's going to reset. And, and not saying that's what should happen. Not saying that a big win against the Cowboys makes any excuses for this week, but just the way things have gone with the Ravens, they're going to have these two duds. They're going to massacre the Cowboys. And then everyone will be like, Oh, it's okay. I'm just, it, we're just going to see who's going to play up to their talent. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is a Who's this is a Cowboys coaching, this is a Cowboys team that you should be able to outcoach. You know, Mike Zimmer's a great defensive mind. I do not think Mike McCarthy is that great of a head coach. I think that he has honestly some of the same issues that Harbaugh does in terms of play calling and, and time management. Um, to me, this is a big week for Harbaugh to show me what 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 can you do? What 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 can you bring to this team? Can you elevate their talent to where they should be? Um Respectfully, I don't know what you want. I don't know like what that looks like to you. They're if they win. Well, we've like we well we've went thing. through it, right? If they no, here's the thing. If they if they have game number one, if they get out to an early lead, Derrick Henry has a twenty yard touchdown run to start to, to open the game. Uh, Zeke fumbles. Dak throws a weird pick. Whatever. It's fourteen nothing, and they go off to the races. Are you really gonna? Have, have you learned anything? No, I no, no, no. I'm saying I think that they have issues. I'm saying that, you know, the offensive line gets beat up. 
do they make the change? Do they come in more prepared for what the Cowboys are going to throw at them? Do they manage their timeouts and clock better so that they actually can have an offense at the end of the game instead of having to just hurry up? To me, it's like, again, I'm not expecting it to be fixed in one week. I think that's not that it's a big ask. I just think it's unreasonable to expect that from John Harbaugh in one week. Um, but I- I'm expecting a tight game. I'm not expecting them to come out and roll. Um, what I'm saying is like, now that we're talking about all these issues, of course, this team would come out, roll the Cowboys and people would think they all went away, but they wouldn't is my point. Exactly what you're saying about if they get up 14, nothing and roll the Cowboys, do you learn anything? No. So to me, if they do that, great. It's a win. Let's move on next week. What's more likely is they face issues. They have trouble with the offensive line and you, and they get in a dog fight. And that's when you see if Harbaugh can really do fix any of these issues. I mean, like, I'm glad that you think that there's a chance that this is going to be fixed. I have not thought there's a chance that these things are going to be fixed for the better part of 18 months now. Um, and the reason why I thought they could win a Super Bowl last year is because I thought they were good enough to win a Super Bowl, like to overcome these deficiencies that the head coach presents, not because of, not in spite of, to overcome the detriment that he brings. Um, but I don't think they will because at the end of the day, and this is a point that like, I've just been tossing out of my head and I want to clarify it because it's going to sound much harsher, maybe not, I guess, than it is, but they're losers. They are the most successful losers in the league right now. And I don't mean losers in a lowercase L where um they're like the Panthers or they're like like going to like be picking in the top five or whatever, but they are a capital L losers. They are losers. They lose things they should not lose. They what find teams are the winners though? The chief it's I don't it's not necessarily who's winners, it's who are not losers. The Bengals yeah, but that, I mean, I think Bengals, I don't think I mean, Bengals would you rather be that? I think false. that's I, see to me. I think that's where you're being. I think you are being too harsh because then it's like, okay, would you rather be the Chargers? Um, uh, would you rather be? Would you, the Bengals are losers for the first two weeks of every season? Do you have? Do you have more faith in the Bengals or the Ravens turning this around? And who has the better roster? The Ravens have the better roster. Who do you think is going to turn it around? I have more faith in the Ravens turning it around. Than the Bengals, really? But that 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 has more to do with what I think about the Bengals, especially the defense, than it with really the does defense, the Ravens. Yeah, um, I think because I think I mean I don't know. I think you could say the most successful losers, and I don't know. You look at the 49ers, like they're also very successful losers. You could make the same argument. I just that just doesn't carry weight with me because the term, when I say the term losers, it's the matter. It's the matter of the 49ers losing the Super Bowl. Yes, but the 49ers also this past week aside, like there's a consistency in like in the highest leverage moments. Fine, the 49ers would not have lost this game. The Bills would not have lost this game. The Bill they would not have lost the Colts game last year. They would have not blown. They would not have lost. Frankly, many or any. Of those I don't think Steelers that's games. true. I don't think that's true of the Bills, especially. I think you see them lose plenty of games that they should win. This Bills team. This Bills team. I like this, like this I, year, they played two games. Team. I mean, I, I, again, saying, I think this is where you're being a little harsh in terms of just branding the team as losers. I mean, I just think that that's. I mean, they're losers until they're not. That's every team in the NFL. Every team in the NFL is the losers, except for the Chiefs. Then. Is what we're saying, and that's fine. But if that's it's according to your expectations, though, um, I, I still, I, I don't, I don't know. I think every, I, I, I think every team is. I, I don't know. I, I think that's being too harsh. I just think that that is a, uh, that's just kind of blanketing the whole team. Like yeah. I, I don't think the I don't think the defense are losers. I don't think. You no, know. that's fair. No, that's like that. No, no, no. That's the that's the that's the right point against that. It's yeah. I don't think. I mean, I think I don't. I think Lamar is out there trying to trying to win games. I just think, um, I don't know. I think if you grade everyone by the Chiefs standard, everyone's failing. Um, but if you look at the other best teams in the league and you look at what happened around the NFL this week, you saw the Lions lose. You saw the 49ers lose. Um, I'm not. 
brushing this off as an any given Sunday loss because we've spent the whole time talking about these systemic issues. Um, I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, I don't think it's the end of the season. But I do think that in the in the long term, they have to consider moving on from Harbaugh this offseason if they can't get it done. Um, Clint Kubiak, come on down. Yeah, Kubiak, Slowick. Th- there are a lot Slowick. of names out there. Um, get get Ben Johnson out of Detroit. Something like that. Um, an offensive mind. I think this is something you've talked about for a long time as an offensive mind, and we have a lot of time to get into head coaching games. But to me, we've talked about this whole time where the issues are. It's very much on the offense. And Harbaugh is, you know, he, he's a very well versed head coach. He's not an offensive minded head coach the way that your Reeds, your McVeighs, your Shanahan's are. And you get a consistency that an offensive head coach brings. You don't have to learn a new scheme every three years. Every you don't need to rely on coordinator goes. Yeah, you don't really need to rely on hit or miss coordinators. Absolutely, and I think that that to me is really looking at this offense more than anything else. Offense um, and, and game management of what positions that he puts his team in is where you figure out where this team goes. So unfortunately ended on a bit of a downer note there. They just thanks so much for joining me. Ray Ravens of the Cowboys next week. We'll be coming out with battle plans later this week um, on that matchup. Uh, until then, thanks so much for joining. Of course. One.